and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, you know, we've talked a lot about the home builders and, uh, you know, this uh, the factors that go into building a home, the supply chain mm. crunch, the effect of rates. Uh, we've seen this big collapse in a, a single family home construction over the last year since rate hikes. But there's a pretty big component of housing that we that is, that I don't think we've really hit yet. Yeah, that's right. We talk a lot about building the houses, but we don't actually talk about securing the land yeah. that those houses are going to be built on. Right. And so like this is also like a pretty big element. And if you read the transcripts of some of the big publicly traded home builders, a lot of the questions they have to uh, ask are like, well, what are, what's your strategy with land acquisition right now? Because you can't build if you uh, don't have more land. But on the other hand, like that's a big capital cost. You're bringing that onto your balance sheet, et cetera. I doubt they want to just have like tons of land mm -hmm. sitting around. So the question of like thinking about acquiring land for housing is like a pretty big dimension of like the adequate housing story. Totally. And it also taps into a lot of other big picture questions like, what are the best markets to yeah. actually build in? Do people take into account maybe climate change considerations, yeah. places that are popular now? You know, you think of some of the Sunbelt states. Are those going to be viable markets in the future? Yeah, all kinds of uh, questions like that. So I, I want to like talk about the land decision because, mm -hmm. you know, again, you know, we talked about the rate hikes. So one of the things that we've seen with the rate hikes is that actual like physical building of supply, it seems to be pretty sensitive. And we've seen this yeah. big drop in um, the uh, uh, the amount of new homes built. But I don't know anything about like how sensitive land decisions are to rate hikes and how fast that they can respond and how fast new land can be acquired, because that seems like a pretty big process. Well, the other thing I would say is this is just an interesting business, the business of securing land that yeah. you then sell on to home builders for development. And I was not aware that this was a business model that existed. I kind of assumed that the developers themselves would go out and buy the land right. and then just build it and do everything themselves. But that is not the case. Uh, that is apparently not the case. I just, I didn't even think about it that way. I just assumed, oh, there's plenty of land out there. You just put up a home. No, I didn't quite think of it. No, that there's so. all these permits yeah. and regulatory red tape that you have to just jump to through. Just to get the land mm -hmm. itself. Okay, well, we are going to be speaking to someone on the land specific side of the question. In studio with us, we're going to be speaking with Chase Emerson. He is the co CEO of Emerson Holdings, a boutique land investment group and broker based in Arizona, which, as we know, is one of the hottest. I guess in, multiple, <laughs> in many ways. In multiple ways, one of the hottest uh, real estate markets in the country about the business of uh, land. So, Chase, thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. Great to be here. Thank you so much. So, why don't you just, um, big picture, what is, what is Emerson Holdings? Why don't you just sort of give us the top line view of like where you sit within the housing industry? B big picture, uh, with our funds and with investor funds, we buy land right on the edge of existing development. We then master plan and design a community, obtain all of the engineering approvals and permits, and then sell to top 25 uh, national home builders. So my big question, it, and I alluded to it in the intro, but why does this business model exist? Mm. Like, Why doesn't a big institutional housing developer just buy the land themselves and then build on it? It's a really difficult industry for institutional investors. So much of it depends on local knowledge and relationships. And so while many, have, many institutions have tried buying land and having land funds, for example, few have had success at that. Uh, looking at the home builders also, home builders have typically started to just buy land that has all of the final approvals in place. So randomly, this is something I was talking about in, in with farmers in rural Connecticut about a week ago, which is how do you go about identifying land that's for sale? And there are all these secret ways that they were telling me about, like looking up on local hunting registries to see who owns the land, because you can contact people oh. and say, can I hunt on your land? And so that's a way of getting in touch with people. So when you say you need local knowledge for right. the market, is that the kind of thing that you're thinking of? Yeah, ex exactly. When someone goes to sell, oftentimes they'll look at who a large landowner is in the area uh, or a broker will have a lead on who may be interested in selling and you want to be the first person that they call with that opportunity. Talk to us a little bit more about the perspective of the home builders themselves mm -hmm. and like 
I guess my question is like, what business, you know, I guess modern capitalism is all about finding like the specific business that you're in and then outsourcing as many sort of like peripheral businesses to third parties. And so in their view, land acquisition, land development is not the business that they're in. Obtaining permits from the local authorities is not the business that they're in. Talk to us a little bit more about like that relationship and what uh, what what service you provide them. Yeah, th- there's been an evolution in the way that home builders buy land. Before the great financial crisis, builders would go on the periphery and purchase large tracts of land, often without the approvals in place. And mm-hmm. many of them got burned. Uh, for, for example, we, we just purchased a property that a home builder paid $100 million for, wow. uh, Sentex Homes, before the downturn. Uh, we purchased it for just over $10 million, just to give you a feel nice. for oh some gosh. of the mistakes that the builders had made. Uh, but today, builders are uh, just trying to buy land that has all Sorry, the approvals wait, in place. Just to be clear. This was a $100 million land track purchase that was made in what, 2007? 2006. 2006. And today, after all of this and the housing recovery and anything, you were able to get it for $10 million? Yes, exactly. Wow. So that really, man, 2006 was crazy. So, you know, you mentioned the permits and regulation. Walk us through what does the process actually look like? Yeah. Say you identify, you know, it's currently farmland. Mm-hmm. It's, it's being used to grow alfalfa and you buy it. How do you go through the next steps and what do those steps look like? And how long does it take? Yeah. So the first step is rezoning. So oftentimes there'll be a holding category for the land. It may have one acre zoning. And so typically it's upzoning it for more density. Um, So the first step is rezoning. The next step is what's called preliminary plat. And that is the early engineering, rough engineering for roads, for infrastructure. What does plat mean? Uh, a plat is uh, a document that gets recorded okay. on the land showing lots and infrastructure. And then the final step is the final engineering, which is called final plat. And, and what one, does that entail and how long is this whole process? So the rezoning process can take 12 to 18 months. If it's political, it can take longer. Mm-hmm. Um, the preliminary platting and final plotting process can also take 18 to 24 months. So there's a long lead time before land can be converted from agricultural land to land that has final approvals. So it sounds like you do some of the urban planning almost for a lot of these developments. Like you decide where the roads are going to be and the basic look of the development? Correct. Yeah. Depending upon the municipality, sometimes you're even setting exact park details, amenities. Um, You're definitely setting lot sizes, community design. And that happens very early in the process. But why don't the home builders want to be in that? Because you'd think that's something like, well, what is the design of our community that we're building? What's it going to look like? What kind of amenities, parks, et cetera? Intuitively, I would think that would be the kind of thing home builders would want. Like, do you work closely with them? Do they tell you generally the sort of trends that are like going on in that direction? Yeah, we have close relationships with home builders and get their feedback early in the process with preferred builder buyers. But we maintain control of that process typically. Sometimes a home builder will enter into escrow with the land seller and then they will control that process. So I want to go back. You know, I, I, I'm still like blown away that there is a piece of land that sold for $100 million in 2006 that's still just worth, uh, still sold for $10 million. Talk to, you know, obviously one of the biggest themes of this podcast is scars from downturns and how they affect behavior for years and years and years. So if you have these home builders that in 2006 spent egregious amounts of land that they were underwater on for 15 years, maybe forever. Talk to us a little bit more about like how that informs still today or up until recently home builder decisions about land purchases. Yeah, it really has impacted the home builder's outlook on how much supply they should keep at any given time. And I think that we're setting up for a shortage of developable lots given their narrower outlook. Um, for example, Meritage Homes said that they have four and a half years of supply, but that's based on current levels of demand. And so if home sales increase, that supply drops from four and a half years to perhaps three years. You know, you mentioned political tension, and I have to ask, it, nimbyism must be a big part of your business, I would expect like dealing with people who don't necessarily want to see large scale residential developments next door. Absolutely. Yeah. Cities and towns go through evolutions of being pro growth. And then once a certain amount of residents live there, uh, the mentality can shift 
And so sometimes you get uh, city leadership that will push for what's called executive housing or larger lots. And that can really hurt housing affordability. Has there been a change over time? So you mentioned Meritage. Right now they say, okay, we have four and a half years of spare capacity to build more homes at current demand levels. We don't know, demand might go up, demand might go down, et cetera. Do those trends change over time? And do home builders generally have like targets? Do they try to match each other? Do they all wanna be within some range? Is there a number that investors like to hear that's optimal these days? Yeah, the, the home builders are typically very conservative in their underwriting. They plan for two to three homes per subdivision per month. And so uh, if, if you consider that um, builders uh, need to uh, plan for just two to three months of housing, sometimes they can be caught flat footed. Sorry, can you explain that? I didn't quite get what, when you say they plan for two or three months per subdivision. Can you, sorry, I didn't quite understand what that Yeah, was. So, so, so two to three homes per subdivision per month is typically what a builder will underwrite a new land acquisition at. So they assume a certain sales level. Okay. But if they only have a, a few years of supply, they can often be caught without existing supply. And then you have a land grab where builders try to acquire new property and start competing again for 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 land parcels. And we're seeing that now in today's market. So just on that note, how do you yourself identify mm. potential purchases? Like what are all the different factors that go into it? I assume you're looking at the market overall, the exact location of the plot, who you're able to sell it to, and maybe um, the amount of liquidity or financing available for those purchases? Yeah, first all of our acquisitions are cash. And so, uh, uh, but the main thing we look for is water. In Arizona, it's critical to have an assured water supply. Mm -hmm. And while 18% of the land in Arizona is private, only a small fraction of that actually has a hundred year water supply. Talk to us more about that. So is it, if you want to get the, go through all of the permitting process, what do you have to demonstrate to local authorities about uh, water? So there's two different uh, jurisdictions in Arizona. There are areas that are known as certificate of assured water supply areas. And in these areas, each individual developer has to demonstrate that they have a hundred year assured water supply for their community. Other areas have what's called a designated provider. And that might be a city, it might be a private water company. And that entity basically gives the landowner their a hundred year designation. Um, it, it's very interesting because it creates different incentives within those areas. So for example, a designated provider area, all demand counts towards that allocation. So if it's industrial, if it's multifamily, there's a fixed amount of water and everything counts towards that total capacity. Within a certificate of assured water supply area, only single family residential is counted. So it's a loophole essentially where multifamily and industrial can take capacity without hmm. any allocation for that. That's really interesting. Huh. So uh, you mentioned how that creates sort of different incentives. Just give us a little bit more color on what you mean. So for, for example, there's a, a city called Casa Grande, which is just outside of Phoenix. Um, you might be familiar with Lucid Motors, uh, one yeah. of the large EV manufacturing yeah. companies. Uh, Casa Grande is a certificate of assured water supply area. And so it's, it's very difficult now. Casa Grande is essentially out of water. So it's very difficult to start a new subdivision in a place like Casa Grande. But you can start a multifamily development. And oftentimes it will look just like a single family subdivision. Hmm. Oh, so you can have something called a multifamily that looks like but if you say, but here's what I don't get. Like, if you say they're running out of water, are they going to run out of water? Yeah, where's the water like, coming from? That's like, I get that it's like a regulatory loophole, but people still need to drink. Or, or more importantly, and, you know, I know there's a lot of semiconductor uh, factories being opened up. Like, that is an extremely water-intensive uh, process to, like, wash the wafers and the silicon. Yeah, for, for the semiconductor industry, I, it, it, is a, it is a ton of water. For example, Taiwan semiconductors uses 20,000 acre feet of water per year. And just to put that into context, yeah. that is roughly 80,000 new homes. Wow. But 
it's a lot of water, but at the same time, it's, it's not a lot of water if you consider agriculture. So agriculture is, in Arizona, there's a lot of cotton production, for example. Huh. And 5,000 acres of cotton production is equivalent to all of Taiwan's semiconductors water capacity. Oh, wow. So from a sort of like GDP value add, my guess is maybe let's have less cotton production right. in Arizona the, and more chips. Exactly. Um, you know, you mentioned that water rights are, are top of mind for you in selecting real estate um, and locations. Has that changed over the years? Has it become more difficult to source water to the extent that, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, mm. this wasn't as pressing an issue? It's become very difficult to secure water. You have to really look at who stands in line to get the water and what your legal rights are. And that's the very first thing that we look at when buying land. And this has like been going on in Arizona for like since the very beginning, right? I mean, like, I mean, it's the desert. The entire West is like, there's no water there. So uh, talk to us just like generally about like, where's that water coming from? Is it piped in from elsewhere? Is it underground aquifers that are depleting, et cetera? And I mean, this is like the history of the American West is like fights over this. Yeah, so Arizona has two main sources of water. The first is the Central Arizona Project, which takes water from the Colorado River. The second is we have abundant groundwater. Depending upon which part of the Phoenix area you're in, there's more abundant water than others. Uh, and so the, with the Colorado River, we're dependent upon allocation from the Colorado River Basin states. And that is more at risk of being cut back Whereas with groundwater, uh, it's very abundant and they're ancient deposits of groundwater. I read an article recently that, and I know like all of these states that sort of depend on Colorado water or Colorado, Colorado River water, they're always like these like negotiations. And I have to imagine that like developers in Arizona want to see more allocated to Arizona and developers in Nevada want to see more develop, you know, New Mexico etc. Can you talk a little bit like is there tension between the states and how it affects you and how it affects your thinking in terms of like who is going to get these allocation? And more importantly, you know, if there, I know that the Southwest is like in a two decade drought and this is like what if there are cutbacks or if there are say like, look, we really need to conserve. What is that going to do to the ability for these like rapidly growing population states to keep growing at the pace that they are? Yeah, we, we, we still have plenty of water for growth, but mu much of the land in Arizona is not uh, going to be developable with water. So that's the first thing that we look at. Uh, we think that areas that have uh, groundwater versus Colorado River water are going to become more and more valuable. Sure. Um, for example, the city of Maricopa is the eighth fastest growing city in the U.S. right now. And that water is entirely uh, from groundwater. And not only... Uh, it's also replenished, which is a key thing so that... Oh, I thought it was just going to empty one day. Yeah. So, so basically, there's affluent produced by subdivisions, by employment. And this affluent is often recharged back into the aquifer or used for irrigation. Um, Maricopa is where they have that big uh, Rio Verde controversy at the moment, right? Yes. Rio Verde Foothills is just outside of the city of Scottsdale. Right. What is that? I don't know about this controversy. This is where it's two communities basically fighting over water rights. So Rio Verde Foothills is an area just outside of the city of Scottsdale. And residents have drilled wells, built homes, and others who were unable to hit groundwater by drilling a well have relied on hauled water. And so basically oh. a truck will fill up water from the city of Scottsdale, drive it out to these homes and fill up their tank, whether it's once every couple of weeks or once a month. That sounds insanely costly. But the city of Scottsdale is now turning off the tap for those residents. Yeah. So everyone is either going to have to drill a private well or find water from elsewhere. I mean, people are talking about this as the start of the water wars or a sort of instance of huh. a preview of the water wars to come. I guess... Uh, big picture existential question, but you develop land exclusively in Arizona. Is Correct. that business model going to be viable, you know, 40 years from now? Yeah, I, I, I think it will be. If you look at the water use in Arizona today, 72% is used by agriculture. And so when you convert agricultural use to residential use, you actually create a lot of savings in terms of net uh, water usage. I see. So basically, like, 
And there was a, I think there was like, isn't one of the, like the huge alfalfa farms, like it's owned by Saudi Arabia, which is yes. their prerogative to like buy land, et cetera. But there are, like, it does seem like building more home, like you could probably grow alfalfa somewhere else, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're leasing uh, roughly 10,000 acres to the Saudi government. You know what we, sh- we should have done? We should have had an alfalfa farmer in Arizona uh, as the other guy. We should have had two part. And it's like, no, we, <laughs> a, a debate. What should Arizona's water be used for? Like housing development or alfalfa? Or alfalfa. I would have liked that. Um, well, why don't we talk a little bit about what you're seeing now? And yeah. Joe kind of alluded to it in the intro, but we have seen a lot of the home builders affected by higher interest rates. Yes. Is that something that you are feeling on your own business model or does it not matter so much because people are still buying up land for future development? So stepping back to when interest rates went up back in June and July, pretty much all of the home builders either extended escrows on land transactions or canceled escrows. Hmm. And so they stopped their land buying entirely. They also often stopped their land development spending. So parcels they had purchased, they stopped finishing some of those lots. We are just starting to see builders uh, approve feasibility on deals and move to closing. So uh, this is based on strong sales in January. Hmm. Right. So housing is picking up. Did you yourself lose uh did you yourself have buyers walk away at some point in 2022 we we had several buyers walk away um most of them asked for extensions and we we said no because we know that land is in tight supply is that just a function i mean how are they making the decision to walk away from these properties do you you notice any patterns yeah i think it's a knee-jerk reaction and there there's a, a difference of opinion between the local land acquisition teams and their corporate view Mm -hmm. of the market, the local teams recognize the land is in short supply and that they're going to have to start buying land again, whereas corporate is often issuing decisions to shut down land spend altogether. Right. Yeah, I was uh, was in a little bit of a prep. I was reading the recent earnings call from Pulte Homes Group. As one does. As one does. And they said, in the fourth quarter, we walked away from 21,000 auction plots and associated 900 million in future land acquisition spend. And as a result of these actions, we incurred a pre-tax charge of 31 million for the write-off. So they post, when they make enter in these deals with you, they post some sort of escrow. If they walk away, they lose it. Correct, uh, correct. Is part of your business, I mean, like, that's obviously not great for you, but is like part of like why there's a business margin or opportunity is essentially like, warehousing this risk, so to speak. So it's like, okay, like in 2022, you take a hit from these home builders that want to walk walk away. And it's like, okay, they can do that because they put some escrow, but then they're really going to pay up in 2023 Mm. and pay a premium. And the idea is that over time, you sort of like make more by warehousing this risk, you make more in the good years when they're like, oh, we need more land suddenly. That's exactly right. A lot of home builders were looking for big price reductions based on the drop in demand. And land sellers just aren't giving the price reductions because mm-hmm. they know that demand will return, there's not more land to build on, and the builders will have to pay if they want to keep home building. Mm. Well, just on that note, I mean, you mentioned the the pickup that we've seen in housing activity in yeah. January. And I think that's surprising some yeah. people who thought that after interest rates went up to, I think, 8% in late last year. That I think they got around 7 Oh. Did they hit 8 Price no, okay, seven or eight percent. What is higher than they have been for many, yeah, many yeah. years? That that would at least knock the market for more than a few months. Talk to us about mm. how you're viewing that portion of the housing market at the moment. What accounts for for the rebound and the strong activity? Yeah, I think builders were surprised by the strong activity in January. We've heard several of the top builders actually exceeded their January sales uh, from the prior year. And so builders have dropped pricing in the range of 15% for entry level homes, but you have to consider they had 35% gross margins mm. at the, at the peak. And oh. now that might be in the, the lower, the mid twenties, but it's still a healthy margin. I mean, I know you're not a builder, but since you talked to them, maybe you can answer that. Is your impression that their supply chain issues setting aside land Lumber, windows, garage doors, we did a million, you know, there were a million stories. Have they eased? They, they have. I think builders have seen roughly $15,000 in cost reductions for entry-level new homes. And so that's helped their margins as well. 
What's the catalyst for another leg up in the housing market, in your opinion? Is it simply interest rates starting to fall back or mortgage rates starting to fall back? I think there's a structural shortage of lots in the Phoenix market and in many other markets. Uh, John Burns Consulting came out with a report that said Phoenix is the fourth most undersupplied housing market. Hmm. And we only have 20,000 finished lots available, which is compared to about 25,000 permits for new homes in a year. Uh, I want to go back to, so two, one short question. Did you slow down or put a pause on the pursuit of new land for your business in 2022? We we did. And we buy through cycles. We focus Mm. on making good buys and we, we did find some opportunities where sellers were impatient and didn't want to wait for the recovery. And so for example, that hundred million dollar transaction that dropped to 10 million was an institutional seller that just wanted to get out. And then can you describe a little bit further your financing? I mean, I think you said you bought them in cash, but do you borrow? Like, can you describe a little bit about like the sort of, uh, yeah, your financial arrangements? Yeah, we we use our internal capital, plus we have a close network of investors. Okay. And but by, by buying for cash, we can be patient and wait for the market to return. Is that unusual in this business to purchase through cash only, or is that sort of the norm? Since the great financial crisis, it's been very difficult to get debt financing for land. Huh. And it also can put pressure on ownership. So we, we find that buying cash gives us the most flexibility. And just on that note, but this type of business, land acquisition, I know you mentioned local knowledge and expertise earlier, but how do you compete against other Mm. land purchasers is it through you know making sure that you're very good at acquiring all the needed permits expeditiously is it simply offering you know good value to a developer and competing on price yeah i I think there's there's a few components to that The, the first is competing on buys so through relationships with landowners with brokers you try to be the person to get the first phone call when an opportunity comes up The second is on your community design. You try to design as closely as possible to what builders will want, Mm -hmm. often two, three, four years out. And the third is by being easy to work with. Since we're talking about how like everything in modern, the modern economy is like outsourced and everyone specializes, do you yourself as a company go through the permitting process or are there other companies whose specialty is helping the land developers walk through all that process? There's a big land development industry that, that, okay. that we use. So we have teams of attorneys who are focused on water law, for example, attorneys focused on rezoning. We have engineers who are special specialists in floodplain. Hmm. So there's a and these are team. outside your company. Right? These are so the so the home builders <laughs> have a th- have an outside company deal with land acquisition. The land acquisition companies uh, have outside parties deal with like uh, yeah the whole the water law. The home builders have land acquisition teams that are sure. internal. Yeah, yeah, right. But they also rely on water law experts and engineers, and oftentimes are the same people that we are using. On the turning land into land that can build a house, whose responsibility and who does that, like paving the roads, um, actually uh, putting in the pipe so that Mm -hmm. water rights can be turned into drink usable water, where does that happen in the process? And is that happen before or after it's sold to the, uh, uh, the home builder? So, so, so going back before the financial crisis, builders would buy land and take it from raw land all the way through the improvements. Um, Just after the financial crisis, builders were still very risk averse. And so they would typically just purchase finished lots, which means all of the water, sewer and roads complete. Ah. Now we're starting to see builders close at final approvals and sometimes do those improvements themselves, or sometimes they'll share that risk with the land seller. Uh, You know, we mentioned a number of times that parts of Arizona have seen a big boom since the pandemic. Everyone moving to these Sunbelt states, everyone wants to enjoy, you know, lower taxes, warmer weather. I want all that. Yes. Yes. We all want that. Um, Do you see that continuing? Like, or do you see that some of the, the pandemic era migration is starting to tail off? We see it continuing for a few reasons. The first is this reshoring trend that you spoke to, I think, on your Mm. recent podcast with Steve Eisman. Um, So we're definitely seeing reshoring in the Phoenix market. Major manufacturing companies are coming to Phoenix. 
Uh, we created uh, more than 80,000 jobs in the prior year. And so there's a robust employment market. It's not just speculation driven. I do think we're going to have to do like a uh, alfalfa. Like I feel like everyone's like, oh, just chips and houses and EVs and all that's great. But we'll get like, all the water stakeholders of Arizona together the Saudi, in one room. Well, the Saudi cattle companies that need alfalfa to feed their cows, like they have, you know, like who's going to replace that? I, I don't know if it's uh, if it's totally obvious. So is there, what else, what, are there any other sort of like uh, interesting dynamics that we've like missed so far or like things that you're thinking about right now? Yeah, I, I, th I think the big thing is unexpected uh, demand increases or drops coupled with a delayed supply response for these yeah. finished lots mm. is, is really setting up for a structural shortage of lots. Right. So actually, this is the question that I wanted to delve further into, which is we talk all the time, again, about scars from the great financial crisis, particularly as they relate to housing and then all the other inputs. But then we had this shock in like 2022 mm -hmm. is the fastest rate hike cycle in like decades, uh, probably it caught a lot of uh, people by surprise. It's weird because it's at a time of like low unemployment, a lot of demand for housing. Talk about the sort of like knock on effects that we'll see just from the rate shock of 2022. So, so stepping back first to COVID, you had yes. builders kind of hit the brakes on yes. development and then they got flat footed when demand returned with a vengeance. And then next we have this increase in rates which has led the builders to pause yet again. Mm. And so we're, we're really setting up for the builders to be in a position where their, their lead time on finishing land and lots is gonna be so tight that they're not gonna be able to meet coming demand if and when rates return to more normal levels. So we've had a bunch of episodes by now about the hangovers left by these sort of extreme cycles. Yeah. What, in your view, when it comes to the real estate market, would help to smooth out some of that volatility or to change developers' behavior in the sense that maybe they feel like they don't have to hit the brakes so hard yeah. on construction yeah. or you know, they don't have to wait so long to start new projects? I, I think the, the growing importance of water in the Arizona market particularly is leading builders to take larger positions where they know that they have water. Oh, oh interesting. And so I, I think that is driving builders to get away from this just in time mindset. And, and so especially the private builders have taken the lead on this in acquiring larger parcels with maybe four or five, six or seven years of supply. Whereas some of the public builders have been focused on just two or three years of supply. This is such an interesting mm. dynamic, the public private that we probably like, uh, and I think you see something in oil too, where it's like in the last, uh, you know, when the oil prices boomed in 2021 and parts of 2022, you had the sort of like quarterly obsessed public companies that right. like, oh, you know, we're maintaining capital discipline. I think a lot of the new production in oil actually came from private companies that didn't feel those constraints. So it's interesting to hear a similar dynamic pop up on the builder side. Yeah, they're, they're definitely more aggressive in the land market. Some of the public, some of the public builders uh, just will not close on property unless all the final approvals are in place. Whereas a private builder uh, sometimes wow. is able to close even without the zoning in place. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that, that gives them an advantage because they're able to acquire the land for a more attractive price. I got to say, though, when you talk about water supply for five or seven years, that still doesn't seem that long to me? What happens after those five or seven years? Well, well, well to be clear, these properties have a hundred year assured water supply oh, I see. that okay. the builders are buying. So Arizona actually has some of the most conservative groundwater management laws in the whole country. Hmm. We have a hundred year planning window. And so these properties have an assured supply for decades. To actually, come. can you clarify that point about how, so you mentioned that industrial uses, they can get away with certain things. What's the, the difference in multifamily development? I think you said multifamily is characterized more like industrial. So what does that result in, in terms of what gets constructed? So, so a, a big boom in the Phoenix market has been the build for rent product, which yeah. Is, so these are single family homes. These are single are family homes rent. with small yards and they build roughly 12 units per the acre. 
So you have much greater density than maybe single family at three or four units to the acre. Uh, and the loophole is they're able to lease these for 364 days a year. And so uh, if it's 365 days a year or more, you have to get 100 year assured water supply. Oh, and, uh, and if you have 364, then what? What are your ob- if you have 364, you do not have to demonstrate. Why does that loophole supply. exist? Oh, Is that was that created on purpose in order to encourage more housing density? Or I I, th- I think it stems from uh, consumer protections and people buying single family homes. I think the the impetus of that law was designed to protect the homeowner, oh. whereas the owner of a maybe 120. 200 unit multifamily development is a bit more sophisticated. So 364, you can renew your rent or do you, do you have to like go sleep at a hotel oh, you, one day a year? <laughs> you can renew your rent. Okay. Okay. So what are you looking out for? You know, we talked a little bit about how unusual this period of time is. We still have the the post pandemic hangover, but housing activity may be picking up a little mm-hmm. bit. But on the other hand, the Fed says that rates aren't going to come down anytime soon. What are you looking out for this year? Like, what's the big catalyst on the horizon? I'm looking for mortgage rates to come down and for buyers to to get off the sidelines. Hmm. I, I think part of the shock has not just been affordability; it's also been psychological. I think some buyers are uh, fear of buying at the top. Uh, and now uh, with, with rates coming down, um, with pent up demand for housing, the, the builders are doing a similar thing as well. They're kind of all looking at each other. When are we going to get back into the market and start buying land again? Mm-hmm. And I think home buyers are doing just exactly the same thing. Do you think, uh, you know, you mentioned, okay, they like walked away from agreements to buy land. Do you think they they do that like walk away from agreements to buy garage doors and windows and we might actually see some constraints emerge because of that 2022 shock on the supply chain stuff that's an interesting question i I know they have paused development trying to wait for pricing to adjust downwards but i think that if if all the buyers return at the same time the home builder demand that might cause another problem maybe they've been uh stockpiling kitchen sinks they might have that's the best case scenario (laughs) all right um, Do you have any kitchen sinks in your uh, in your uh, in, in the basement of your home, Tracy? I have but one kitchen uh, sink. One. I do have an extra coal stove, though, randomly. Oh, quick question. Speaking of stoves, hmm. most of the uh, homes that you uh, that get built in Arizona, electric or gas ovens? Oh, mostly okay. electric on the high end gas stoves. Gas stoves. That's what I meant. Okay. This isn't a politics yeah, show. Yeah, we're not going to get into. I did I, only in the last month did uh, <laughs> uh, did uh, electric versus gas oven or stoves become po- a political question? But I was curious about that. <laughs> All right, Chase Emerson. So great to have you on the podcast. There's like uh, totally new. You know, the other thing that I'm glad you brought it up. Um, the whole build for rent market is something we. I think we talked about it the other day, but got to do more on that. This is yet another episode that has uh, sprung forth like three other episodes Absolutely. that we need to do, including one obviously up diving in even more on water rights, I think. Absolutely. All right, Chase, thank you so much. That was so cool. Thank you for having me. You know, Tracy, there are so many interesting things in that conversation, but I also, I am like just sort of like generally fascinated by the degree to which like all companies want to eliminate every single risk outside of like their one narrow expertise, which I guess on some level is very obvious. We know outsourcing and third party consultants is big, but like this is like a very interesting example of it for me. I guess it's the natural tendency towards specialization, yeah. right? But I... It is strange that I had never considered that the housing developers would not be buying the land themselves. I always just assumed that was the way it worked. I'm still blown away by that one stat that there were like tracts of land that were selling for $100 million 15 years ago. Or I guess, no, that's longer, 2006. That's like, I can't even, 17 years ago, whatever. Maybe like I did not appreciate how crazy that bubble was. That is a true bath on a financial asset, I got to say. Um, not even a financial asset, actual land. Yeah. All right. Uh, Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest Chase Emerson on Twitter at AZ Land Investor. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. 
And for all Bloomberg podcasts, check them out under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post transcripts of the episodes, Tracy and I blog, and we have a newsletter that comes out every Friday. Go there, use your email, sign up, get it in your inbox. Thanks for listening.